Hello to everybody, and thanks for coming here. We are turning in person, and we are pleased to have here today Maya Fischba as a speaker. Uh, Maya was a student of uh, Daniel Holtz in the University, University of Chicago, and she's now a NASA Einstein Fellow at the Northwestern University, and she's an expert on gravitational waves of observations. She's a member of LIGO, and she will tell us about astrophysics and cosmology, that, what we can learn with the full Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. So I'll try to cover a lot of topics. Um, we'll see. Feel free to interrupt with questions at any time. Um, yeah. I guess the main lesson will be that there's a lot to learn from black hole physics. OK, so just as a quick introduction to what these black hole mergers are, um, here you can see two black holes. This is a simulation of two black holes in this binary system. So they're gravitationally bound. Um, and you can see that they're actually, so they're orbiting around each other and the orbit is shrinking. They're getting closer and closer together as orbital energy and angular momentum is emitted in this gravitational radiation. And eventually they merge. And so these are the black hole mergers that I'll be talking about. Um, we can't actually see when two black holes merge. Um, but as I said, there's this gravitational radiation that gets sourced from the binary black holes. And um, you can think of this gravitational radiation as these perturbations on this background space time. And they then travel out from the source across the universe, interacting very weakly. And so they reach us here on Earth and we can detect them. And the way that we can detect gravitational waves is through their effect on chest masses. And so the simplest way to imagine the effect of gravitational waves is to set up this ring of chest masses that you see here. And now imagine that there is a gravitational wave uh, that's propagating and hitting through the screen. And you see that it causes this ring of test masses to deform, to stretch and squeeze. And so you can see that the test masses that are kind of furthest apart on the circle are moving more uh, than the ones that are closer together. So gravitational waves are creating this relative change in distance, which is the gravitational wave strain. And when we have gravitational waves from two black holes, you can think of the morphology of the gravitational wave signal in these three different parts. So first you have the in spiral, where now the frequency of the gravitational wave is set by the masses of the two black holes. The frequency of the gravitational wave is twice the orbital frequency. And then the gravitational radiation is causing the black holes to get closer and closer together. So the frequency is increasing, as is the amplitude. Um, and then eventually you get to this merger part of the signal where you have a peak in the gravitational wave amplitude. And then you have this single black hole that's left. And you have this ring down as the, that black hole settles down uh, and stops emitting gravitational radiation. And so often you'll see a time frequency representation of this kind of waveform, uh, which is called a chirp because of the fact that the frequency and the amplitude of the gravitational wave is increasing as it sweeps across. Um, and so you can see that here you have something that starts off pretty quiet at pretty low frequencies, and then it evolves to be louder and higher frequencies. So it sounds like a chirp. And the great thing is that we're actually now routinely detecting these gravitational waves from these black hole mergers. So we have a network of gravitational wave detectors across the world. There are the two LIGO detectors in the US, the Virgo detector in Italy, um, Kagra in Japan, which is just now coming online and joined uh, the, the network at the very end of the last observing run. And then LIGO India, which is uh, hopefully joining the network later this decade. And all of these detectors are very similar. The way 
they work is uh, by essentially trying to detect this stretching and squeezing of matter, except for the test masses here are these mirrors at the end of these four kilometer, in the case of LIGO, tunnels. Um, and so as a gravitational wave passes overhead of the detector, those mirrors at the end of the detector arms are going to move a little bit. And we measure that by laser. Um, so by shooting light out to that mirror and looking at the travel time. Um, so okay, just summarizing that, that brief introduction to gravitational waves and observing them, we have these compact binary coalescences or these black hole and neutron star mergers that are emitting these loud gravitational waves. These gravitational waves are stretching and squeezing matter, and they can be detected as this relative change in distance um, by these laser interferometers. And so here you can see this very nice poster of our latest gravitational wave catalog where each one of these panels here shows one of these chirps from a real gravitational wave that was observed in our detectors. And you can see that there are a lot of these panels. Um, so the latest catalog from Lago Virgo Cabra is the third gravitational wave transit catalog for GWTC3, which has around 90 of these compact binary coalescences. And these are mostly mergers of two black holes, although there's a couple of binary neutron stars in there as well as a couple of neutron star black hole mergers. But I'll mostly be focusing mostly on the binary black hole just because there are more of them. So when we have these gravitational wave observations of these black holes and neutron stars, one thing that we want to understand is how are they made? How is our universe making these black holes? We know that one way that our universe makes black holes is as the remnants of massive stars, so the end states of massive stellar evolution. Um, and that's what you can see here in this, this diagram is for the initial mass of the star, so it's starting from around 90 uh, to more than 300 solar masses, um, and the initial metallicity of that star, so how many heavy, el heavy elements does it have heavier than helium, um, whether it all ended its life as a neutron star for the relatively low masses, uh, with high metallicities or as a black hole um, or not leave behind a remnant at all, which I'll get to later. Uh, but this is all, th these are all uh, things that we're trying to understand. So this diagram is extremely uncertain and that's, that's one of the things that we're trying to understand by now observing this big sample of these stellar mass black holes. The other thing that we want to understand is, so all of the black holes that we're observing in gravitational waves come in pairs. So we want to understand how are binary black holes made? How is the universe getting black holes to be in binary systems? And there's a lot of astrophysics that is involved here, but broadly, you can think of this um, in two separate umbrella classes of these possible formation channels. One is the isolated channel where you start off with two stars in a binary star system and they evolve throughout their life. The more massive star usually dies first, maybe it explodes as a supernova and leaves behind a black hole. And then the second star dies, uh, maybe exploding in a supernova and then leaves behind another black hole. And then Maybe you have two black holes that are close enough together that they're actually able to merge within the age of the universe. And this is um, kind of hard to, to make this happen because you need these two black holes to be close enough together by the time they're those black holes, but not too close together when they're stars because massive stars expand a lot during their lives. So if they were too close together, one of the stars would swallow the other one and you wouldn't have two stars anymore. Um, so there's a lot of uh, kind of uncertain episodes of mass transfer, unstable mass transfer, something known as a common envelope that we think might go on to make this actually possible. 
And then the second class of formation channels is you don't start off with two stars in a binary system, you start off with a whole bunch of stars in a dense stellar environment, like a globular cluster or a center of a galaxy. And then those stars give rise to a bunch of black holes and those black holes interact with each other dynamically and maybe dynamically assemble binaries um, that are then merging uh, within the age of the universe. Then kind of taking a, a step back, we also want to understand and these gravitational wave observations are giving us a tool to understand where and when do these black holes merge and kind of within the cosmological context of these mergers. So these black holes live in galaxies. We're able to observe these black holes out to great distances and kind of looking back in time. Uh, we can start to think about what kind of galaxies do they live in. Um, also, as I'll talk about later, these black holes can actually trace the cosmic expansion. Um, so it can, they can serve as useful probes of cosmology. Okay, so kind of putting all of these questions together, um, we'd like to understand what are the origins of these black holes. So what were their progenitors? Um, I'm going to assume for this talk that the progenitors of these black holes are massive stars, although there are other very exciting alternative possibilities like that the progenitors of these black holes uh, are not stars and actually primordial black holes born in the early universe. But I'm not really going to talk about that further. Um, assuming they're massive stars, we want to understand when and where did these massive stars live? How did these stars die? How did they pair up and to merger partners and form these binaries? Um, how did those binaries actually merge? And then how did the resulting merger affect the environment? So when two black holes merge, they probably don't affect their environment too much. But if the merger involves a neutron star, that neutron star can get ripped apart, or you can have two neutron stars collide. Um, and so you can have this very dense nuclear matter that is undergoing nucleosynthesis and producing some of the heaviest elements. In, um, and that can, uh, have a big effect on the environment and on the abundance of things like gold and platinum and shiny elements uh, in, in our galaxy. Um, and then finally, what is the cosmological context for these mergers? So all of these pieces are going to affect the observable properties of gravitational wave events. If we can kind of use these gravitational wave events and go back to try to understand their history. So when we observe these gravitational waves from binary black holes, there are a handful of properties that we can tease out of that gravitational wave data. And the first one, which is the has, has the biggest impact on the gravitational wave form, are the masses of the two black holes. So how big is each black hole, which usually label the more massive one as M1, the primary mass, and the less massive one as M2, the secondary mass that's going to affect the frequencies of your gravitational wave form. Um, then we can also learn a bit about how fast those black holes are spinning and where those spin axes are pointing. Um, then we can learn where and when did the merger happen. So as I'll talk more about later, the gravitational wave signal includes the luminosity distance to the source, so how far away it was. and um, under some cosmology, that luminosity distance is related to a redshift, which is telling us how, how fast the universe is expanding then and how long ago did that merger happen? How old was the universe when this merger happened? Um, and then all of these things together are going to help us understand those questions on the previous slide. So that allows us to take that catalog, the poster of all those chirps that I showed and visualize it as something like this, which is showing the masses um, of the black holes involved in every merger. So each one of these aero systems is one gravitational wave observation where you have the masses of the two black holes shown on the y-axis. So here it was like a eight solar mass black hole with a 12 solar mass black hole that merged and formed a 20 or so solar mass black hole. And 
one thing that, that I do is try to take all of these single observations of these single merger events and think of the population of binary black holes in the universe. And so to do that, I'm not so concerned with what is what are the masses of individual systems, but what is something that we can learn about the whole population? So for example, which is the, the first example I'll talk about, is we can think of a population model that's describing the distribution of masses. So it might look something like what you see in this diagram. Here, if we assume this power law model to black hole masses, this describes the rate as a function of black hole mass. And maybe at low masses, uh, there are more black holes in our universe. And at high masses, there are fewer black holes. Maybe there are also these cutoffs, like there are no black holes below five solar masses or above 50 solar masses. Um, so in this case, we have a bunch of black hole masses. And we're trying to figure out what is the minimum black hole mass, this power law slope, and the maximum black hole mass. And to actually infer these parameters, we have to take into account measurement uncertainty. So the fact that we can't perfectly measure the masses of each event, uh, we also have to take into account selection effects. So the fact that some systems are easier to detect than others based on their mass. Can I ask you something on the plot, sir? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, you expect close to the maximum mass advance due to the black holes that couldn't make it to uh, keep more the mass as well? Or, uh, yeah, this is this. So this is just a super simple model, which is like the first model that we fit. But yeah, as I'll talk about later, this model is already ruled out, guys. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's more complicated. Mm -hmm. are, are you going to discuss later the constraints on the maximum, the expectations for the maximum mass? Yeah, I'll talk about that later. Okay, thank you. The um, selection effects you mean here are on the observability with LIGO, et cetera. Yeah. Um, presumably, there also could be some maybe much harder to calculate selection effects on things like who makes it into a binary that's going to merge. Or yes. I don't know yeah. if it's possible to say anything about that. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, that's a great point. So my, my next slide is actually about these selection effects. Um, but yeah, so these are selection effects on just for a given binary system. How likely are we to detect it? There are more complicated selection effects, like which black hole masses and spins make it into a binary system, um, especially if we're looking at other systems and other phases of the evolution. Like if before you have a binary black hole system, you have a black hole with a star in a binary system and we see those as high mass x-ray binaries but not all of those systems then evolve into binary black holes so it is more complicated and in general requires actually mod modeling the evolution um, and for what i'll talk about here there is essentially no astrophysical modeling um, which means we we can't like go all the way into answering some of those questions without that, but it's also a particular. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the selection effects, by far the dominant form of selection effects um, for these observations, these gravitational wave observations, is as a function of mass. So here I'm showing the sensitive space time volume um, as a function of the total mass of this binary black hole system. Um, and the different lines here just show different mass ratios. Um, you can see that for the more, the heavier black holes, we can observe them out to greater distance because they emit louder gravitational waves, which means we're probing a larger volume of the universe to those black holes, which basically just means that these massive black holes are overrepresented in our catalog um, compared to the smaller black holes. The yes, yeah, so this this assumes that the um, the distribution, I mean, the yeah, this notion of the kind of sensitive volume assumes that black holes are randomly distributed in volume across the sky and that they're they have random inclinations. Mm -hmm. 
So we begin with the stream from the actual chocolate. So yeah, the emission of the gravitational waves does depend on like the inclination of the source, like the gravitational waves are preferentially emitted in the plane of the binary as opposed to, I mean, like perpendicular to the plane as opposed to in the plane. Um, this, this plot here is assuming like zero spin, but yeah, in the case where you have spin in your black holes, that binary is also processing if the spin, if there's any spin component in the plane, it causes precession of the binary system. Um, and it does, and also if you have spins that's aligned with the orbit, it causes there to be more overall angular momentum that has to be emitted. So if we can, the gravitational waves are emitted for a bit longer. Um, that's known as the orbital hangup effect. These are, those effects are subdominant to the mass effect, but we do take all of that into account when we then try to infer what is the underlying population, not just the detected population. Um, but this is just, this is like the kind of by far what is dominating our selection effects is just mass. And I'm going to come back to this soon. So I just wanted to what show that. Off the 2.2 behavior. Well. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So at the largest masses, there are a couple of effects. The main one being that we have a pretty sharp lower frequency cutoff to where we're sensitive, which for the first few observing runs has been around 20 to 30 hertz. Um, hopefully on the ground, we can get that down to 10 hertz, um, not below that because of thermal, because of seismic activity noise. But anyway, um, that lower frequency cutoff means that these massive mergers, especially when you start putting them at farther distances, they're actually getting redshifted. So a 200 solar mass merger at redshift zero, redshift one is going to look like a 400 solar mass merger. The more massive mergers are merging at lower frequencies, they start to shift out of band. So their merger is happening at two lower frequencies. So eventually, like when you go to a thousand solar masses in total mass, we're not sensitive to those at all, um, which is why we'd like to have other kinds of gravitational wave detectors. Uh, okay, cool. So yeah, for the rest of the talk, I'll just go through a few of these astrophysical lessons um, having to do with the mass distribution, the evolution of cosmic time, and then also some cosmology. Um, and so I'll start with gaps in the mass distribution. Um, and there are two gaps that we talk about in the compact object mass distribution. For this talk, I'll just be talking about the upper black hole mass gap, um, but know that there's also another mass gap, but I'm happy to talk about that later. Okay, so this is the same plot that I showed before, and I wanted to show it because um, it also relates to this point about what is the maximum black hole mass. Um, in the first two observing runs, we had 10 binary black holes, and we did this analysis, made this plot, and we realized that all of those, those first 10 binary black holes, we had a few that were down here with total masses of around 20 to 30, um, a, a few that had total masses um, up to 80 solar masses, so like 60 to 80 solar masses. Um, but we didn't have any black holes that had total masses above 80 solar masses or component black hole masses above 40 solar masses. Um, even though you can see that we're very sensitive to those black holes. And so we concluded that these systems must be rare in the underlying population. So what we actually did was fit this simple power law model. Again, this is just from the first 10 events. Um, and we fit the minimum black hole mass, the power law slope, the maximum black hole mass. Um, each one of these red, uh, of these purplish blue lines that you see here is one draw from the posterior that we infer on that mass distribution. So you can see that most of these posterior draws 
cut off at around 40 solar masses. Um, there are, are 500 of these draws here. So you can see there's only like a, a few in 500 chance that the truncation happens at masses as high as 50 to 60. So this 40 solar mass cutoff was very interesting uh, because it was actually perfectly lining up with predictions. Um, so we kind of found this purely observationally and then realized that there had been these longstanding predictions dating back to the 60s of something called the parent stability or a pulsational parent stability supernova, which is expected to happen when the carbon oxygen core of your massive star is between around 40 and 120 solar masses, then normally for the star to kind of stay stable and shining normally, you have gravity that's pushing in on the star and photons that are producing this light that are providing pressure to counteract gravity. Um, in this mass range, the star the core of the star is hot enough that those photons are spontaneously producing E plus E minus pairs that leave the star and you don't have enough pressure support to counteract gravity. And so you have this sudden uh, violent explosion of your stellar core, which explosively ignites oxygen, which then causes your whole core of the star to explode and completely disrupt itself and not leave behind a black hole at all. Um, so that's what this parent stability supernova is, and it is expected to produce this gap of black holes between around 40 and 120 solar masses, so all those cores are disrupting. Um, there are some uncertainties in this location, uh, so approximately 40 to 120 solar masses, which are due to things like the nuclear reaction rates, which are controlling how much oxygen there is in the core of your star, which is what's providing this dramatic explosion. Um, the stellar structure, also possible beyond standard model physics. If you have any particles in your stellar core, that can also affect the energetics of where this mass gap starts and ends. Um, and then also importantly, if you have black holes formed from other channels, they might populate the gap. So we already know from the very first detection of gravitational waves, we had a 30 solar mass black hole merged with another 30 solar mass black hole and form a 60 solar mass black hole. That black hole is in the mass cap, that 60 solar mass black hole. Then the question is, can that black hole go on to merge again? Um, and, and so that's, uh, that, that is very well possible in certain conditions. So um, is that something we know anything about, by the way, like the ability for it to keep merging like that? Yeah, um, so we don't we don't know too much. Um, we know that usually, so it's possible that black holes are merging in these dynamical, like dense stellar environments. Um, usually, when two when two black holes merge, that gravitational radiation actually imparts a kick, so it's preferentially in one direction, especially if your black holes are spinning in certain configurations. And that gravitational wave recoil kick can be like hundreds to even thousands of kilometers per second, which is often enough to eject it from globular clusters, like kind of normal globular clusters, which have a speed speeds of around 10 to 30 kilometers per second. Um, so that's kind of the main hurdle to overcome. Like you, there are black holes in dense stellar environments, but do they receive, are, are their spins small enough so the recoil kicks are small enough or are those dense environments dense enough that they can retain those black holes in the cluster so that they can then go on to form another binary. Uh, yeah. I'm assuming the uh, distribution of mass yeah, yeah, so that's that is possible. Um, and as I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, so we already we know observationally that it's not a sharp cutoff because 
we've seen, this is the first example that we saw of a black hole binary where one of the black holes was around 85 solar masses, the other black hole was around 60 solar masses. Um, both of them actually seem to be above that 40 solar mass limit that we inferred. And there are other ones like it in the data. And so really the, the only concrete thing we learned is that there's a population of these black holes with masses above the 40 solar mass limit that are in these binary systems that merge. Um, they make up a relatively small fraction of the underlying population. So they're only around 1% of the underlying population, which is why we didn't see them among the first 10. Because our gravitational wave selection effects are biasing us to detect more of those massive black holes, that's why we're, we have a few of them in our data, even though they're only 1% of the underlying population. And so we can now fit our map distribution, and we know that it's not consistent with this sharp cutoff because otherwise it wouldn't make sense that we measured a sharp cutoff at 40, now a sharp cutoff is at 80, like that just means our model is wrong. Um, and so kind of a, a simple extension to that is to add another feature to that power law. So here there's a Gaussian um, peak thing on top of an underlying power law. Um, and you can see that there are uh, there are more of these black holes between 30 and 40 solar masses or so, and that's kind of this drop off in the rate as a function of mass. Um, so it could be that because of these additional complications, um, like you have fallback of the Hudson envelope or accretion, or um, maybe you have stellar mergers before that star becomes a black hole, are kind of making what used to what we used to think was a sharp cutoff look a little bit more tapered. Um, and so maybe this thing that we're seeing here is the feature of pair instability. It's just not a sharp cutoff anymore. Um, but it could also be that there is some underlying, there's some mass distribution here that does have a kind of lower edge of the mass gap starting at 40. And maybe you have some black holes that are contaminating that mass gap because they're formed from previous mergers. Or it could also be that this has nothing to do with pair instability. Um, the, there is some pair instability cutoff maybe, but maybe it just starts at much higher core masses at like 70 or 80 solar masses because of things like different nuclear reaction rates or new physics. So we still kind of need to disentangle everything that's going on also by looking at the mass distribution simultaneously with things like the spin distribution, um, which also provides more information. Um, so that's that uh, kind of. Is, is there a sense for theory of the bar? Why you don't have a training number? Oh, sorry. Are, are there periods of uncertainty oh. on why you don't have a training number? Yeah, yeah. So the theoretical uncertainties yeah, so this is the this like this is the lower edge of the mass gap that we're probing, which is like that 40 number. Um, so yeah, that 40 number could start like maybe at 60 solar masses. I think it's pretty hard to push it up to 80. That would kind of require a lot of different things conspiring with the nuclear reaction rates that we use in these calculations are like three sigma off. Plus maybe there's the stars are holding on to more of their hydrogen envelope than we think is reasonable for a binary system. And so you have another 10 solar masses of material that's able to fall onto that core from the some extended envelope. Um, yeah, so there are, it is possible um, then we also need something else to explain why we see some feature between around 30 and 40 solar masses. But, and what about the other numbers? Um, yeah, yeah. It's hard to push the 120 number down without also pushing the 40 number down. Um, actually, the width of the mass gap is something that seems sort of stable. Uh, but yeah, it is so about like this 
one event where I said the masses were around 85 and 60 solar masses. I actually, I did write a paper showing that it is possible to interpret this event as 120 solar mass black hole with a 40 solar mass black hole um, or something like that. So have this event actually straddle the gap. But that seems less likely now that we actually have this population. Like it's not just that one event that seems to have its masses in the gap. There's actually um, a bunch of these that have masses of around 60. 50 to 60 solar masses to the Sorry, I don't understand that in the source. So, that's a black hole merger of an individual amount of masses up for the total masses. Yeah, so for the, um, at the massive end, what we're really seeing in the gravitational wave merger is the merger and ring down part of the signal, which is most sensitive to the final black hole mass, which is essentially the total mass of the system. Um, for lower masses of around like 2010 solar masses and below, uh, we can actually see more of the in spiral. And what's driving the in spiral is what's called the chirp mass, which is another combination of the two masses. But the mass ratio, which you need in both of these cases to measure the component masses, is quite poorly measured and it's very degenerate with the spin of the system. They come in at the same kind of order in the gravitational wave signal. So the component masses are actually pretty poorly measured. Okay. So I want to pick the parents' ability to promote stuff I see is mostly going to be an isolated star. If you have something like common envelope first or something, can that change? Uh, Situation. Um, yeah. 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 So definitely, like having stars. Uh, yeah, the binary nature can change a lot of things. Um, the the parent stability process really is just set by the mass of this carbon oxygen core. So it's true that if you have if you have some additional way because of the binary system to dump more mass onto onto that part, like onto the black hole after it's born, um, mostly through accretion, um, you can change things. It also is sensitive to like the rotation of the core. So if you can get uh, something that's rapidly rotating, you can increase the lower edge of the gap. Uh, but yeah, I'm not I'm not sure if things like common envelope can change it. Uh, yeah, and definitely if you have like a previous stellar merger, like if your progenitor star is now the product of two stars that merge, that's going to make the structure a lot more complicated. So you can get more massive black holes. Um, okay, the next thing I'll quickly talk about is just- uh, Sorry, there is uh, maybe Michael asking another question. I think he has to respond. Oh yeah, I had my hand up for a while. Um, uh, okay. we, we don't actually know, understand very well the mechanics of a supernova explosion. Um, supernova explosions have to can't be spherically symmetric. They have to be asymmetrical. So this must affect the argument about the uh, pair creation. Um, can one escape that argument if you have a very asymmetrical uh, supernova explosion? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, my understanding is that the paired stability supernova is pretty distinct from like a normal core collapse supernova. Uh, and that you really are just explosively igniting oxygen um, because of this, this kind of sudden collapse due to the positron electron pair production. Um, and so I'm not sure if like the geometry matters that much. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there probably is something that we don't understand about these parent stability supernova theoretically. Mm. Um, yeah. 
Can I ask you one more question? Um, yes. On the previous slide, you have a, a fit, um, but I, th I think you didn't show us the data that defends this peak around 35 solar masses. Did you show us that? Um, no, not, I mean, indirectly. Uh, so yeah, I mean, so to actually make this fit, there are actually two fits that are shown here. Um, one from the previous catalog and the latest fit is in blue here. Um, so to get this fit, we have to infer the masses of all of the individual events and then also take into account the selection effects. Right, so but in principle, you could show a histogram of the number of mergers you observe corrected for the selection effects. That might be more convincing. Yeah, so we have a fit um, in the paper that this is from, you can find on archive here. There is a fit to something like a histogram. Even a histogram though is a model. And we have to take we have to take into account the uncertainty on each individual measurement. Yeah. With this kind of like hierarchical Bayesian framework. Um, if you if you do something naive like just make a histogram of like the median measurements for each event, you will not get the right thing. Although we people people are kind of trying that and seeing like how wrong can you get, or is it? Um, right, but if you use a model with a cutoff, there'll always be a pile up where you put the cutoff. So, hard to yeah, yeah. Um, Right, so you can get some pretty unintuitive things. I mean, fortunately right now, it looks like the data doesn't have a cutoff, so there's less confusion there. But yeah, if you if you do the naive thing, you can often go astray. Because um, also your, your, just your measurement uncertainties could cause things to look like a pilot. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll look and see what's in the archive article. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Um, Okay, so I'll just say a few things about this evolution with cosmic time on the way to tell you a bit about cosmology. Um, so basically what I want to say here is that we're also measuring the distances to all of these events. And in this plot, I'm assuming that we know the background cosmology so we can convert these distances to redshifts. Um, which you see here on the, the top axis and actually um, or equivalently look back time um, and in blue is our inference on the merger rate as a function of look back time on redshift normalized to the merger rate today and so you can see that we've inferred that the merger rate uh, at kind of where the maximum distance that we can detect gravitational wave events at around redshift one or around eight billion years ago is higher than the merger rate today. And something that we want to compare this to is the star formation rate. So the star formation rate is shown here in this orange yellow color. Um, and you can see that at a, a long time ago, the universe didn't form any stars and then it started forming stars. And then the star formation rate peaked around 10 billion years ago at around redshift two. And since then the universe has been forming fewer stars. And if we think that these black holes are formed from stars, their progenitors are stars, but there's just some delay between when the stars form and when they form black holes, and then the biggest delay is how long those binary black holes took to merge. And so different delays will give you a different shape of this redshift evolution. Um, so if you have relatively short delay time, so minimum delay time of 10 million years, and then all these models, I'm assuming the time delay distribution scales off as t to the minus one after that. Um, so if your minimum time delay is pretty short, you'll get something that looks more like the star formation rate. If your delay time tends to be long, like always longer than three billion years, you'll get something that peaks um, at much lower redshift, and we can actually dual that out with our current observations. 
So one thing we can do is actually measure the time delay distribution in this way, which is telling us about the physics of what actually caused this binary to merge because different astrophysics will lead to different amounts of time it takes. Um, now we're able to put things out to red to flip, but just a quick advertisement for next generation detectors, we'll be able to map this population out to very high redshift. So larger, probably larger redshifts than the universe even made in black holes. In addition to mapping the overall rate, we can look at things like, are, are the masses of black holes changing with cosmic time? Are the spins of black holes different? a long time ago compared to today and things like that. Um, another quick thing is that in addition to just gravitational waves, we can try to understand the host galaxies of these gravitational waves. So this is from a paper led by Sismita Adhikari, who many of you may know, um, he was recently a postdoc here. Uh, and here, this is um, this paper was showing how if you can identify the galaxies that these mergers happen in and look at their properties, like their star formation rate and the stellar mass of those galaxies, you can actually learn about the time delays of the binary black holes. Because if you have black holes, um, or this was, was actually for neutron stars where we can more, more easily identify host galaxies, but the story is the same. If your time delays are pretty short, um, then most of your host galaxies will just be the ones that have the highest star formation rate because their most recent star formation was very recently. If you have time delays that are very long, most of your host galaxies will just be the more massive ones. So the ones that had a lot of star formation rate a long time ago. So if you observe a bunch of host galaxies and they all seem to be very massive and kind of red, not very star forming, you can infer that the time delays are long. Um, compared to short. Do you expect yeah. different time delays in neutron star case versus the black hole case? Or do you expect them to behave to similarly at their main Yeah, so it, it really depends um, on the formation sure. channel. Uh, within the formation channel, within each formation channel, there's probably also some dependence on mass, like neutron stars are essentially very low mass, and like black holes are larger mass. Um, so that, that would be the main effect. Um, otherwise, I, I think the effect would mostly just be through mass. There's not a huge effect just because there are neutron stars. Okay, yeah, so if we saw this through neutron stars, we could like, say something about black hole. Yeah, 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 to some extent. Yeah. And so that was a simulation, right? I mean, is this the previous slide? Yeah, this is this is so this is what we expect to see. Right now we have one event where we know the host galaxy. Uh, um that, that I've shown here this okay. cross. So the idea is that when we have a bunch of events, we can combine them statistically and see which distribution they look like. But now this is just simulation. Um, so is there a lambda CDM for standard model expectation for what the debate should be? So the delay time is really set by the like the formation channel. Um, so it's mostly just the it's mostly set by right like how far away are your black holes um, by the time that they start to be gravitational radiation dominated the in spiral. Yeah. Um, so that depends a lot on like the the mass transfer physics, um, whether you're, there's like, whether there's a triple involved that's driving the merger, whether your mergers happen inside a cluster. Um, so it really, it mostly, like measuring the actual tabulated is mostly telling us about the formation channel if we compare it to theoretical predictions from different channels. Uh, but I will show that uh, if I, yeah, I'll try to go quickly, but the question of the redshift evolution is also related to trying to do cosmology with these things. Um, okay, so I will quickly review um, some results from gravitational waves as cosmological probes. So the main idea here is that these gravitational wave sources are standard sirens 
in that they provide a direct measurement of the moving off the distance. And the way this works is the gravitational strain that we measure um, is going to depend intrinsically on this redshifted chirp mass of the source. So the more massive black holes are emitting intrinsically louder gravitational waves. And then it's going to decay as it propagates to us inversely with luminosity distance to that source. Now, the really cool thing is that that intrinsic brightness of the gravitational wave, which is set by this combination, um, this chirp mass combination, is actually encoded directly in the frequency evolution. So if you observe the frequency and the frequency evolution of the gravitational wave signal, that's telling you what this redshifted chirp mass is, um, which is telling you how loud is that source intrinsically. So how loud you observe it is just telling you the luminosity distance. Um, so we don't we so we are able to get this catalog of luminosity distances, one luminosity distance for each event, but the redshift is degenerate with the mass. Um, and so if our goal is to measure the redshift distance relation, uh, we have a bunch of points here um, on the x-axis, but we don't have uh, directly from gravitation away, we don't really know the redshift. Um, and again, we want to measure this because it's telling us about the constituents of the universe um, through this H of Z. Uh, and locally, very locally, this slope is the Hubble constant. Um, and so our kind of first attempt at gravitational wave cosmology was with GW170817, which was a binary neutron star that had an electromagnetic counterpart, which told us what the host galaxy was. And so we could get the distance from the gravitational waves and the redshift from the host galaxy. And the actual analysis is a, a bit more complicated, but essentially you can draw a line through them and the, the slope of that line is the Hubble constant. Um, and so another way of seeing that Hubble constant measurement is this posterior, uh, which we measured H naught to be around 70 plus 12 minus eight. So that's what's here in blue. Um, and I, yeah, there are, so that was just one event for which we have a counterpart. There are a lot of other ways that you might get the redshift. Um, and I'll just talk about a few of them. So I talked about the counterpart one. The other way that we use is the, with a galaxy catalog, which is essentially giving us the prior on the redshift for each event, assuming that gravitational wave sources come from galaxies. And so just a, a first illustration of this um, is we, we did this with VW 170817, asking what if we didn't know the host galaxy? We actually know the host galaxy to be NBC4993. But what if we didn't know that to be the host galaxy? Well, we could have just assumed it came from any galaxy in the universe um, and essentially repeated the measurement for any possible galaxy and statistically marginalized over the fact that we don't know which galaxy it was. This event also happened to be extremely well localized, the best localized gravitational wave event so far was localized to 16 square degrees. Um, if, if you look at all the galaxies in that 16 square degree region, these, I'm just plotting all the galaxies within the 99% localization volume, the contours show 90% and 50%. Um, there are still a lot of galaxies there, like 400 galaxies. If you assume you don't, you know the distance, but maybe you don't know the redshift, you're considering a bunch of different values for the Hubble constant. So you have to consider a bunch of different possible redshifts um, and you don't know which one it was. So there's, there's around 400 galaxies. But the good news is that galaxies cluster. So most of the galaxies actually belong to a single group of galaxies um, over here. So they're all at the same redshift. Um, and that actually happens to contain the right galaxy. Um, so that allowed us to, to measure um, the Hubble constant kind of using statistical method as just an illustration. We've looked at how this scales with future detections um, you can see that in the counterpart case, if we know which galaxy it is, the convergence is a lot faster when you combine a lot of events. For the statistical events, 
it, it, the statistical pace is a lot slower. Um, so for binary neutron stars, the convergence is around seven times slower. Um, and this is, it's even worse for black holes. Um, but I guess the takeaway from this is if we have counterparts, we expect, we expect the kind of one sigma measurement of the Hubble constant to improve as 15% over square root number of events. If we don't have counterparts, things are harder. Um, Sorry, that was the, with, with it, without the counterparts, I guess this statistics of 40% over root n, was that assuming, so for example, it must depend on what kind of sources you're looking at. So looking at neutron stars must be different yeah. than black holes. Yeah. What so kind it, of black holes? Yeah, it depends, it depends a lot on the masses you look at because it's easier when they're closer by because then there are fewer galaxies for kind of the same error, um, the same relative distance error, you're just closer by. So there are fewer galaxies. So for black holes, it's it's a lot worse. Um, no one has actually done a realistic simulation for the black hole case. One reason why it's complicated. So I could say that the statistical method has been applied to a number of events. There are a couple of papers by Antonella Palmisi, which have done this for kind of the best localized gravitational wave events, which there are two that are kind of really well localized and using a galaxy catalog from DECAM. Um, one problem with the statistical method is that you're using this, these galaxies as your redshift prior. You actually can't get away from the fact that the masses you observe are also carrying cosmological information. And so if you ignore the masses um, and think about the mass distribution, you, you'll just get a kind of biased thing because the assumptions you put in about the mass distribution are carrying information that the cosmology. Um, and I can kind of- This is uh, like a when they would have formed what size mass or? So the main thing is that um, it, because we are measuring these redshifted masses, so we're measuring each event, we're not only measuring the luminosity distance, we're also measuring a detector frame mass. And so in general, um, you have to assume some distribution for the, for the source frame mass distribution in order to properly account for the selection effects. Um, so that's the main way that these two talk to each other. But your assumption about the source frame mass distribution is itself carrying cosmological information, because if you assume that there is some source frame mass distribution, um, especially if there is some features in that source frame mass distribution, like apparent stability feature around 40 solar masses, then if, if you look at the, there's some redshift distance relation that's given in our universe, and then these redshifted masses as a function of luminosity distance, so this year a bunch of points are all the different events, they're going to have this redshifted mass. So this is if there's some feature around 40 solar masses, here there's going to be some feature at 40 solar masses times one plus redshift if you go in different luminosity distances. So the cool thing is that um, if you have some understanding of the model that gives your source for mass distribution, you can use that to sim simultaneously infer like where is this feature in source frame mass, but also what is the redshift distance relation. Um, the kind of annoying thing is that this is always, even if your source frame mass distribution doesn't have any sharp cutoffs, kind of the relevant source frame masses you're considering are always wanting to propagate to the other parts of, if you're trying to, if you're not trying to use this to get redshift, um, this is still going to tell you something about the likely right tips of your events. So you'll just be using the wrong information or ignoring information and then getting a bias. So you should, you should do this. Um, you should use all the right tip information. So just talk on that I can see how it would mean you're ignoring information, but why would it bias it if we ignore it? Like we start the luminosity distance feature, we just need luminosity distance and yeah. to go like, why, why do we induce a bias? Which I would make, which I yeah, so you introduce a bias because you're not 
you're not actually ignoring it. You're assuming something about it, and you have to assume. Oh, so you're saying if you did a base, full base analysis and just you sort of put in the wrong thing. Then. Yeah. Okay. So so you have you have to yeah you have to assume something about the mass distribution because you have to consider what are the what's the probability of detecting sources at any distance. You have to be able to compare your luminosity distance horizon to your redshift horizon. So that's what I meant by it enters in through the selection effect. You have to kind of know, um, because, because the thing is you're always, you can't, uh, you're like analyzing every source. So you're analyzing like every point here on its own, uh, which gives you some luminosity distance, but you're combining events. So you have some distribution of luminosity distances across your events. The, your detected luminosity distance distribution, which is what you're using, is going to depend on what is the underlying luminosity distance distribution of all sources multiplied by your selection effects. And so your selection effects are a very strong function of mass. Um, so that's, that's sort of how it enters in is because you can't ignore if you're doing any of these methods, you can't ignore information from your detected luminosity distance distribution. Still, but you, sorry, it still feels strange there. This is way of doing. I mean, I, I agree it will mess up your variance, but without increasing bias, but that's kind of irrelevant because you need. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. Okay. The last, yeah, but just the last thing I wanted to say um, as another way of getting. Redshift information, and I want to say this because um, this is a, a project led by Christine Gay, who is a super talented high school student who is graduating soon, and she's actually going to be coming here for college. Um, so if you see her, uh, you should definitely try to work with her. She's amazing. Um, so what we did in, in this paper is um, showing that, again, if you now instead of using a galaxy catalog as your prior for redshift, you might have a different astrophysical redshift prior. So with binary neutron stars, we can kind of measure the rate as a function of redshift with gravitational waves, but you might also get some sense of what's the rate as a function of redshift through, uh, through, through observing like gamma ray bursts or kilonova, or we have other ways of accessing how many binary neutron star mergers there are at any redshift. And here we assume that we just know that binary neutron star mergers trace the star formation rate, which means that there are a lot of binary star mergers at redshift two where the star formation rate peaks. Um, now, what you're measuring on the gravitational wave side, when you have these next generation detectors that are observing gravitational wave events out to redshift of 10 in a standard cosmology. Um, what you're observing is the kind of how many sources there are as a function of distance. And here, just for illustration, is a exaggerated a large range of possible Hubble constant values in your universe. Um, and you can see that for these different Hubble constant values, for if the binary neutron star rate peaks at redshift Two, in terms of distance, that peak will be at different values just because you have a different redshift distance relation. And so by measuring our distance distribution of gravitational wave events and measuring where that peak distance is, you can use that. If you know where the peak redshift is, you can use that to infer the cosmology. Um, so that's another kind of cool method. Uh, just to conclude, um, there's, yeah, sorry for, for going over. I guess, right, there's a lot we can learn from gravitational wave populations. I tried to give a general survey of just some of what we're learning. So how are black holes and neutron stars made? We can learn about that from looking at these mass gaps. I didn't talk about spins at all, but that's also really interesting, thinking about the relationship of the two components in a binary merger to tell us about their merger partners. Um, then taking a step back, we can learn where and when do these black holes and neutron stars merge. So how does this population evolve across cosmic time? How can we compare that um, to the star formation rate, the metallicity evolution of the universe? What can we learn from that connection? 
um, also with observing the host galaxies of gravitational wave sources. And then even a, a bigger step back is just thinking about the cosmological implications of these sources. Um, and so I talk mostly about the Hubble constant um, and how we can kind of measure the Hubble constant with standard sirens. But I, I hope that the Hubble constant will, this Hubble constant tension will eventually get a little less interesting and we can start to address the kind of bigger problems in cosmology, which is like, what is dark energy? Um, so we can probe that with standard sirens both through the background expansion, um, actually most of our binary black holes of observations that we'll get in the next few years will be at around redshift 0.8, which is very interesting for dark energy, but also standard sirens are a unique probe of this because uh, they're also able to, to probe possible gravitational wave propagation modifications, which would be caused by if dark energy is basically anything other than a cosmological constant, it would also affect the propagation of these gravitational waves, which are these tensor perturbations. Um, and so that's also kind of a unique handle on that. Um, okay, yeah, so with that, uh, that's, that's the end of my talk and thanks for taking around half the hour. I was puzzled about your determination of the dates and the effect of the star formation at the middle of the talk. Uh, or... Yeah, that uh, we have one information about the distribution of the masses of the center. So, what determines that what we observe is the intrinsic mass distribution plus the number of how did you separate the student of the distance without knowing the distance? Yeah, so here um, is it, was that your question about like how do we measure this rate as a function of redshift? Okay, yeah, so this is simultaneously done with inferring the mass distribution. Um, so we simultaneously infer the mass distribution of sources and the evolution with redshift. Here we're assuming that the mass distribution itself does not evolve with redshift, although other times we relax that assumption and actually fit the redshift evolution of the mass distribution. Um, but here, I guess another another thing here is that we're fixing the background cosmology. So this assumes that the redshift distance relation is given by like the best fit Planck 2015. Distribution and mass distribution. Yeah, yeah. The combination of the two here, observed. Yeah, yeah. There's, so there's definitely a degeneracy between them. Um, and we, so this is just projected onto the redshift, but we also fit the mass distribution. Um, and here, I guess we, we get information because at the lowest redshift, we can pretty much observe all masses. Um, and so we use those observations to say, okay, now we've measured the mass distribution where at high redshift, we can actually only observe the most massive black holes, but we're assuming that there are also all these low mass black holes that we know exist at low redshift. And they also exist at high redshift, but we can't see them and they're, they're contributing to the rate. So definitely when we relax the assumption that the mass distribution doesn't evolve with redshift, our constraints on this are completely degenerate with, okay, at high redshifts, we only observe massive black holes. Maybe the mass distribution evolves in such a way that we it's much more chalk heavy at high redshift. Um, yeah, so a crucial assumption here is that the mass distribution is the same across redshift. That, that, that is a third Sorry? That's also the third unknown which comes in to what we observe. That's how the mass distribution. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we can actually get this for like we can look at the just the massive black holes that we can see across all redshifts and make this plot for 
just black holes above 30 solar masses. Um, and we've actually did that in this second paper. Also, what I mentioned is that communication from the uh, short gamma reverse, but the A type could be made up in very short gamma reverse transformation. Then you would then have a convention. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, that's that's a great point. And also, apparently now long gamma ray bursts can also have kilonova counterparts and maybe be compact object mergers. There was like a recent detection of a long GRB thing came out a couple of weeks ago that had an associated kilonova with the short gamma. But yes. So I haven't heard stuff, but is the idea that the short gamma ray bursts can be neutral star, neutral star? Is that, well, yeah. is that the logic? Yeah. Okay. Do, do we know that? Is that we know that at least when we don't know that all short gamma ray bursts come from binary neutron star mergers, but we know from the first binary neutron star mm -hmm. detection that had a short gamma ray burst okay. counterpart. Um, that so the idea is that if we assume that the rest of them are, then we get some information about the that they find something. Yeah, but it also is, yeah, my understanding is that it's also pretty hard to infer the redshift evolution of the short. GRB rate because we often don't have the we we don't know kind of the, like the intrinsic luminosity distribution so we don't really unless except for the ones with host galaxies we don't know the redshift. Is, is the delay time likely to be independent of the mass or I might have thought in principle what makes a 50 solar mass yeah. will merge is very different than what makes two neutral stars. Yeah, yeah. So it is. So um, the delay time probably does depend on the mass. And there are a few different uh, recent papers that argue that one by um, Lika Manson, who's a grad student at Harvard. Um, yeah. And the argument, even within a single formation channel, like it's it seems that common envelope evolution. So when you have this unstable mass transfer, that kind of semi-magically, because we don't really understand how it works, brings the black hole and the star that's the center of the second black hole together really quickly. Um, we think that may only work for at lower masses. And so that causes a short delay time because you can very efficiently kind of bring the two, the black hole and the star together. Uh, for heavier masses, it, we think that the, it doesn't work, and so you only really have the stable mass transfer, and so it, it usually takes a lot longer for things to merge. Um, that's one thing that we can then try to study by looking at what does the redshift, how does the redshift evolution of the rate look like for different masses. Um, yeah, but it does get more complicated because also the Formation rate can be different for the different masses. So there's kind of we can, we can't we can't do it just from gravitational waves. So like the thing about actual gamma ray bursts is like extremely useful. Like we we should combine that. We have to combine theory more. Um, there's a lot of open questions. Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much for a very informative talk. So a bit of provocative question in that regard, given that probably something has already become systematically limited mm -hmm. analysis with assumptions that need to be made moving forward at like 10 times more of these events. What complementary data you would you wish to have in hand that gives the most informative picture overall? I'm thinking like, yeah. is it like micro lensing events of like things that do not rely on Merger time scales and blur things over. Or what is yeah, yeah, that's gap? yeah, that's a great question. I think there's, uh, I think basically like everything else we have access to. <laughs> so yeah, like other observations of stellar mass black holes, um, like like micro lensing detection of stellar mass black holes, black holes in X-ray binary systems, um, long gamma ray bursts, the majority of which we think are caused by core collapse supernovae that give birth to black holes. 
um, and that are powered by the rotation of black holes. And those even get over a very high redshift range, uh, like short gamma ray burns, which are we think are binary neutron star mergers or neutron star black hole mergers. Um, binary stars, like there was a, a recent, and there's, I think just last week, there was like an observation of a companion star to a supernova explosion, like the supernova exploded in 2013, and then the, the kind of all the supernova stuff went away. They were able with Hubble to actually see the companion star, and like there's probably a black hole there too from the supernova explosion. So that's like another kind of possible progenitor to these systems. Um, so there are a ton of a ton of other data sets that are probing either like the cousin evolutionary pathways of binary black holes, um, like alternative pathways that have that would have otherwise become binary black holes, except maybe one tiny thing went different, uh, or like the progenitors of binary black hole systems, I kind of getting a different, a picture sort of earlier in the evolution for a different system. Um, and so there's, we need to use those other observations. Um, and those other observations are also Kind of increasing in volume a lot with more wide field surveys with like more transients. So I think it is it is very exciting and gravitational waves are kind of what part of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. So is there extra? Yeah, Um. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the. I mean, the ring gown would tell us like the total mass of the black hole, um, and I suppose. I don't know if it would it would also get redshifted in the same way. So I don't know if there's like additional information there about the cosmological redshift. One thing that's pretty cool, so right now we can't like we can't detect the ring down independently of the spiral merger. So right now that this point is not that relevant, but like when we have very loud events, like one thing that's really cool is that the the redshift in the ring down could actually be a little different than the redshift in the in spiral if the binary black hole is receiving a large gravitational wave recoil hit. Like it could be right because then you have you have the cosmological redshift, but you have like this peculiar velocity because now maybe the black the final black hole is actually traveling at like an extra thousand kilometers per second. Um, and so it's actually extra redshifted because of that. And so if you can detect that, the, like comparing the total mass, the redshifted total mass in the ring down compared to the redshifted total mass you get in the in spiral, you might actually directly measure like this free flow head. I think there's a paper by Babide Jarosa on that. Um, but yeah, I don't know if it's extra information about the cosmological redshift because in terms of like the redshifted masses, it's sort of the same combination. With the paper's conclusion that this is actually like plausibly detectable, could that be very cool? I think with next generation detectors, yeah. Yeah, it should be exactly it should be exactly generate with the should be exactly generated in the same way, like the same cosmology, but it'd be cool to detect it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, the would be, yeah, the would be, yeah, the SNL would be like 10 to the 5 or something. So that, isn't it 10 you minus 5? You close by one anyway, so because yeah. you, know, you want your kick to be large compared to the cosmological recession of the velocity that you have, right? Otherwise, you can't do it. But so you yeah. want a very close by one, which is also going to create a lot. Well, you need to Yeah, I think you need SNR at like at least 10 minus 5. Which means that your total SNR is like at least a couple hundred. You can, oh, maybe I'm missing something. Okay. 
you could detect it's a small wrench. That's another eight seems to Well, I don't know. Yeah, I guess for the proofs that you see, yeah, I guess for the proofs you probably want SNR as Yeah, I think. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, yeah. I haven't read that. So, what proofs do you think was nothing? I think the first author is DeRosa. So I'm going to pick different things. The last point you mentioned in the uh, last slide. Uh, yeah. Um, so was that meant to be some effect which is different from uh, the expansion history of the universe? Yeah. So um, what do you have in mind there? Yeah, so it's, it, so it basically it's possible that gravitational waves experience extra friction as they're propagating. Um, so instead of having like the as compared to like photons with basic difference between gravitational waves or something like so, that. Yeah. So it, essentially you have a modification to this. Like instead of the amplitude of your signal decaying inversely with luminosity distance, mm -hmm. it it could decay slower or faster um, with luminosity distances. So like if there's some extra friction term, then the luminosity distances you measure with gravitational waves might be different from like the electromagnetic luminosity distance. If you if you assume this relationship, you might infer that your your gravitational waves are like seem too quiet. So you're inferring that they come from farther away, where they actually are coming from closer by, uh, and that that can be caused by by some modified gravity theories, um, like if you have a a running of the Planck mass. So essentially, like using g changes with redshift, um, or if you yeah, if you have different, so basically, a, like a lot of the cosmological modified gravity theory space was ruled out by the measurement that the speed of gravitational waves is the same as the speed of light from the binary neutron star event. Um, but there's still this part of cosmological modified gravity theory. So here it's kind of motivated by trying to explain dark energy where there are deviations in the amplitude rather than the speed of the gravitational wave. Um, and so that parameter space is still pretty open, but we can constrain that if we measure like gravitational wave luminosity distances and they don't match the distances to the counterparts that we get under like a fixed background cosmology. I see that Michael has a, a question. So yes, I asked a question before, and I found a plot. May I share my screen? <laughs> so I made you co-host. Maybe uh, yeah. I suppose that now you can share. Well, Maya has to stop here. So, so here's a plot from the um, archive that uh, Maya suggested. Actually, this is a very interesting paper, but obviously listening to the talk and trying to decipher this, it's been rather difficult. But this is somehow the more primary view of the observations. And I understand what now why it's not a histogram because uh, the authors here chose to plot a Gaussian distribution of the possible masses of each event. So you can see that there is an apparent gap. This is in the chirp mass between 10 and 20. But my question is, is that gap st statistically strong? Is there a measure of that? Um, that this gap is somehow unexpected and deviant from a smooth distribution of chirp masses? Yeah, that's a that's a good question that I I've been struggling with myself because it's like statistically significant with respect to what. So here I think it's a bunch of it essentially the model that's being fit here is a Gaussian mixture model. So just a, a mixture of a bunch of Gaussians. And so you're always you're always going to find like peaks and dips there. So I think there you'd for to quantify like statistical significance within this model, maybe you want to 
kind of get a posterior on where your local maxima and local minima are and compare that to a bunch of prior draws from the model and like how many local maxima and minima they have. Um, another, so a, another kind of approach um, is the, that, that we had in the LIGO collaboration paper is like assuming that the, there's some base power law model and then you have a like, spline modulations on top of that and then you can ask does this power law plus like extra spline modulations um yeah so yeah. somewhere here is the curve you showed on the left and on yeah. the next page there's another um attempt to do this yeah, yeah. so it's p it's, in it's the really PS. very confusing to me whether a smooth curve can fit this data or not and uh, i guess it's still unclear we have to get more statistics yeah yeah no and all of these models assume some level of smoothness so there's this um like similar the one most similar to the histogram suggestion is the one in green bgp which is been the gaussian process which fits like a 2d histogram but has a smoothness prior which is given in process which says that like the heights and neighboring bins should be sort of smooth um, so it doesn't really allow for sharp features yeah yeah but when we're kind of in this transition regime right now where we have like a little less than a hundred events. So a lot of things are still kind of driven by what models we consider. Um, and, but yeah, in, in the future, I think we'll definitely move towards like the more non-parametric approaches, which I think is what, what you're also hinting at is, yeah, like, then these differences between the models will become less relevant. We'll just have the statistical power to, you know, make a histogram and actually count like how many events are there in each small mass bit. But we're we're not quite there yet. So I'll, there's kind of some subtleties in the model assumptions. Okay. Well, in any case, thank you for a very fascinating lecture. Uh, um, it'll be interesting to follow this in the future. Yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> nice uh, and yeah, I see a very last question maybe by Alex Street, but uh, I don't know, given that you're on Zoom, if you want to ask now, I guess. Yeah, yeah I, I, I won't ask you to share my screen, so at least uh, that's good news. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I mean, this discussion of the distribution of, of masses is fascinating, and, and the key point, I think, is the, the evolution of the mass of black holes after they're formed, right? So let's say there's some astrophysical event, and you get either, you know, Chandrasekhar type masses or more massive things. But then the question is, what do we know about this evolution? Because on the one hand, if you know a typical black hole grows much by, by a factor of many during its subsequent lifetime then there is no reason to expect a cutoff of 40 or, or any other cutoff and on the other hand if that time scale is much longer than the age of the universe then what do we think about uh, supermassive black holes where do they come from then, you know these uh, classes of uh, stellar mass black holes are not cannot really be the sources so, so how does one make a physics estimate for, for what happens? And I don't just mean black hole, black hole mergers. I mean, black holes just can grow by sitting there and consuming gas around them or, or, or whatever else. Like how, do, uh, uh, how does one make a sensible physics estimate of this? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And I guess this also kind of ties into the earlier question I think from you about like our astrophysical selection effects and that we're only detecting black holes in binaries with other black holes and if so we know that black holes can grow
grow through repeated mergers into the black hole. So this might be part of the black hole growth process that actually ties into like the formation of intermediate mass, maybe supermassive black holes. That might be like a regime of growing big black holes. And I think that's uh, that's one thing we're probing. But the other thing is like, are these black holes maybe growing from their birth masses by accretion? And we think that if there is significant so I guess I guess the first thing is that we think that in these environments that are giving rise to these binary black hole systems there isn't a lot of material to be accreted to begin with if you do have um, except for material from the companion star so you could have material from the like you have a first born black hole with its stellar companion and that could accrete material onto that first born black hole but if you really crank up the accretion during that stage of the evolution, you'll tend to drive the two objects further apart. And so that makes it less likely that they'll actually be involved in a merger. So maybe there are stellar mass black holes that are accreting a lot of material from the stellar companion, but then those aren't merging. Um, but maybe those are the ones that we're able to see in like high mass extra binaries, for example. But in, in general, also in, in that scenario, in order to have considerable accretion, you need to invoke super Eddington accretion because the lifetime of the massive star is not long enough to grow the mass of the black hole significantly through just Eddington limited accretion. But um, yeah, I guess maybe that's another example of how we need other observations to really get a handle on that beyond just for gravitational. See, they're not really. <laughs> I can stop the recording. Yeah. <sighs> That's just why I have to sit up. Like, <laughs> I have a question about comparison of the statistical procedure and, and uh, the nearest galaxy. So there's multi messenger type yeah. measurement of how. Uh, uh, how parameter? So, so you show how it scales with events, right? Mm -hmm. The events are not one to one because I assume some events can actually have a multi messenger, whereas you can work with more events, right? Right, yeah. Is that true? So, is that already taken into account when you're scaling up? Like, is events a, a placeholder for time or are no. events not the same? Right, right. So, no, you're right that the uh. I said something like the statistical method will take, it'll basically take like seven times more events right. than the counterpart page. But it's true, like right now we have 70 events and only one of them have the counterpart. So like maybe we are in that regime where we just won't have as many counterparts and so we have to do the statistical method. But that seven times as many events was also super optimistic because it's, Assuming binary neutron stars, so they're all relatively close by and well 